CCOS, the World Bank, and the Nature Conservancy, and um, cut to per mill, four per mill, to uh, organize this uh, this hackathon. I'm quite excited after uh, the webinar and the prep session, um, the deep dive that we had a week ago to uh, to get to this point in this process, and I'm really hoping for some really creative thinking and and problem solving from from all the breakout groups. So so welcome. Um, uh, we uh, will ask you to introduce yourself once you, to save time here. To, uh, we'll ask you to introduce yourself very briefly when you get into your your uh, uh, hackathon groups, your breakout groups, um, which are organized by by project. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, there are uh, captions, uh, closed captions available. So um, if you uh, wish to avail yourself of that, um, perhaps maybe send. Uh, Actually, we don't have a slide for this um, uh, now that I'm realizing this, but please send a, a link, uh, excuse me, a private chat to, uh, to Bailey uh, and she'll make sure that you get the link. Bailey, does that make sense? Or I, I put the link in the chat so everyone should right. be able to right. see it. If Thank, you there. Thank you, Bailey. I knew you were on it. All right, good. So if you want to avail yourself to the closed captioning, uh, please click on the link in the chat box that uh, Bailey just shared with everybody. Um, so the, what we're going to do is we'll be in this plenary session for a bit here. Uh, after I'm done, Sinero will uh, summarize the outcomes of the discussion that happened uh, last week as the sort of the foundation for, uh, for your discussions in these uh, breakout groups. Um, and you will be in four breakout groups. After Sinero's done, uh, Madeline is working right now to check our records about who we assigned to what breakout group and we'll put that on the screen just to make sure uh, we all think we have a critical mass for each of these uh, breakout groups uh, that will be in uh, four tables, um, uh, each of them focusing on a specific project. You will start the session in the breakouts with a present presentation. You already have materials. Hopefully you've availed yourself of those materials and read a bit about each of these projects. Uh, and particularly the one that you've been assigned to, which we tried to uh, communicate to you in the past. So we have two from the World Bank, uh, one from uh, Fort Per Mill and, and one from the Nature Conservancy. Um, and each group will have a facilitator, a note taker. Uh, we will be taking notes in the AFRIS platform that uh, Fort Per Mill has uh, made available to us. If you haven't accessed that, uh, no worries. The facilitator and note taker are on that platform and we'll be using it and then at the very least sharing the screen. Um, it's really a facilitator choice whether they're going to share this note taking screen throughout the breakouts or towards the end to make sure that the summary of the discussion is, is clear. Um, so um, if you're having any technical problems with Zoom, um, please um, do a private chat with Madeline Smith uh, and or send her an email which is msmith at marid.org. Madeline, maybe you can put your email address in the chat box now. When you're in breakout group, uh, you will not be able to send her a, a, a private chat. So send an email if you're having a technical problem with Zoom. And if you're having a technical problem with AFRIS, anybody, um, please make Conrad uh, aware of that. Um, he's the go-to person for that, but Conrad has some responsibilities in the breakout group. Conrad, I wonder if you can also put your email address uh, in the chat box as well. Um, let's see. I think with that, um, um, I'm going to turn it turn it over to Sinero um, to uh, to uh, make some comments about this. Present some mm -hmm. outcomes from uh, the first week, the first session last week. Sinero, over to you, please. Sure. Thanks. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, right now. So can you see that team? The yes, finest you, you might want to put it in presentation mode, but yes. Sure. Is it working? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, uh, um, good day everyone. So my name is Siniro and I'm happy to, to have you here again. So um, I'm going to uh, briefly uh, summarize a few points for the hackathon today based on the conversations uh, we had in the last two events and uh, that happened uh, over the last two weeks. 
So uh, regarding the the MRV meeting the finance the finance needs, right? So we we could and we can highlight uh, basically two aspects. Uh, the first one, of course, it should uh, encourage investment, and uh, in this context, it can start uh, very simple by being able to support positive climate change uh, results in, in in this sense. And then uh, the second point is that it should be structured in a framework that can evolve over time uh, in accuracy into carbon market initiatives. So in this context, uh, the question is, how can we build a sequenced uh, approach for evolving uh, MRV accuracy over time in consonance with, with the finance uh, community needs? Right? So based on, on our last two events, we identified uh, five major steps that should that we should keep in mind uh, as we hack the projects today. Right? So uh, basically, <clears throat> uh, the first one is to identify the goal for climate finance. So we basically have three uh, climate finance goals. So one is the green finance, the second is results-based payments, and the third is the carbon mar uh, credit markets. So the first one it's basically a, 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 um, a goal that where, where practices are aligned with, with climate mitigation and co-benefits, where the certainty uh, of direct, directional change is likely, but the impact uh, level is not measured. The second one, uh, the results-based payments, it's based on the defined uh, climate mitigation results that support an accounting system that can foster confidence in impacts, although medium and high uh, quantification uncertainty may apply. And the top one is where the quantification of climate results follows uh, rules and procedures determined by uh, protocols and standards under 30 party verification. And then we can lower uncertainty and increase credibility uh, in results. And the, and the second step is, so how to plan, how to build on these three uh, uh, climate goals. So as we climb up this uh, pyramid, we basically reduce uncertainty and increase accuracy, supported by a, an increased uh, MRV requirements and sophistication, with, which consequently uh, increase data needs and technical capacity, right? So therefore, this figure uh, give us a sense of the route and the level of demand for meeting higher uh, MRV requirements as a function of the climate uh, finance uh, goal we have under projects. And it, it also outlines some uh, considerations for designing uh, an MRV as we hack the projects today, in, in today's sessions, basically. So, and then <coughs> it, uh, considerations that we should be and should keep in mind while we hack projects today. So first, uh, what needs to be estimated? For example, carbon sinks, avoided carbon loss, GAG emissions and mitigation co-benefits, and how to ensure uh, benefits to farmers. And how well we, we should uh, measure that in terms of uh, accuracy and uncertainty needs. Uh, third, how to reduce uh, risks of uh, impermanence and no known performance. Uh, and fourth, how to minimize costs. For, for example, what is the accept acceptable percentage that uh, a project can spend in MRV in order to, to deliver uh, results? And other considerations regarding this, this design, such as the scalability and verification needs, frequency of uh, estimates, uh, reporting requirements, and so on. Uh, fourth, uh, we, what we uh, learned from previous sessions that, or basically day one, that the hackathon, uh, uh, what we learned from day one is that we, we should move uh, and go for hybrid approaches encompassing uh, direct measurements with modeling and remote sensing uh, if we want 
to uh, make the MRV affordable as we climb up the 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 needs for a lower uncertainty and uh, uh, higher accuracy. So under this context, we, we, should, lack, we should look at uh, uh, three aspects. So in the measurement, the project characteristics and, and resources available and plan activity data collection, uh, how to focus on, on few uh, high quality measurements, what to prioritize uh, in terms of uh, soil sampling, uh, if we should uh, sample in soil for uh, soil carbon determination or uh, soil bulk density, what is the method to be used, uh, use or not uh, pedotransfer transfer functions and so on. And then uh, how to deal with data gaps. So how can we fill out uh, data gaps? Um, should we use uh, like scientific literature, expert consultation, global database, database what, what is the recommendation? And in terms of modeling, uh, how to choose a model, how to calibrate it, uh, what are the technical requirements and, and, and capacities and acceptable uh, uncertainties we should uh, uh, take um, into consideration or uh, look for. And remote sensing, applications and requirements. So how hard is to use a remote sensing under that scope, right? And, and, uh, and also the, the co-benefits assessment. So can we generate co-benefits assessment uh, from or uh, intending with uh, soil carbon measurements? So that's a, a question we, we should uh, put today. And uh, finally, the aggregation across the scale. So aggregation should be uh, used to reduce uh, project level variation effects. So what is the uh, application for aggregation? So next, and, and finally, reducing risk of uh, impermanence and no performance. So what can we uh, use to address that? So we have discounted carbon credits, buffers in, in carbon credits uh, allocated. We have accounting at, uh, at landscape level, and we also have, have the issue of verification type and frequency. <clears throat> right, so that's the major uh, five points. And then uh, today, session, we will be developing uh, an innovative uh, soil carbon accounting protocol applied in, in four projects that you, I understand that you have a chance to look at in AFRIS. And uh, what we want as an outcome are basically three. So first is what is the current or planned approach for soil carbon, carbon accounting for this project? So project uh, developers will be presenting us what are uh, the current approach. And then we're gonna go through uh, how uh, could a soil carbon MRV accounting be improved to help the project to meet their finance goals, right? And finally, what are the priority practical next step for this project? So we basically uh, want a sort of blueprint for this project in terms of how they can move ahead in terms of accuracy, uh, uncertainty while they're, they're, they meet and seek their financial goals. So uh, I stop there and hoping this point uh, give us some uh, insights for the today's session. And uh, I now open uh, the floor to, to questions before we break. We break. So thank, thank you and, and team, uh, over to you. Thank you, uh, Sinero, um, very helpful. Folks, I would ask you to, uh, if you're familiar with Zoom, you know the virtual hand raising function, um, which is um, if you click on the participant icon in your menu bar, the participant list will come up. And at the bottom of that, you can see a raise hand function to keep track of anybody that would like to, uh, to get into the, the queue and, and raise any questions you might have about what you heard uh, presented from Sinero. And then uh, if you're on video, I can see any waved hands, actual human hands, if um, anybody has any questions. So let me just see if there are any questions. We're, we're currently pretty much on time right now, but um, anybody have any questions about what Sinero presented? And I will just reinforce a little bit more if there are no questions about the, the objectives and what you're trying to focus on in the breakout groups. Um, any questions about Sinero's presentation? Any additions, any thoughts that people who were there last week, a lot of you were, uh, you wanna elaborate on something or 
was that adequate? I'm not hearing anybody, seeing anybody or seeing any virtual hands. Tim, I can't use my hand, but okay, I can. There you go. So I want to ask the finance community based on what Sinero presented, if there's anything critical that's missing. Financiers, those of you who are trying to move capital and resources to soil sequestration, anybody? Okay. Um, let me, I don't see anybody contributing here. So, um, anybody, it looks like some movement here. So, uh, uh, Keith, go ahead, please. No, I did, just, just a thought. And I, I, you know, I like the, the, uh, the points on, on permanence, impermanence, but, you know, I wonder why sometimes we don't include in that, you know, what, what's critical for permanence is, is maybe profitability, profitability of the new system. Uh, you know, I think we have the land use systems we have now because they're, they're sort of profitable given the, you know, the, the economic system and how things are subsidized and, and all of that. But I think there's an issue about, uh, you know, designing interventions that are, you know, profitable and, 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 and how can we measure that and how can that be a key point in determining whether, uh, you know, whether to support a, a project going forward because I think that is the single best thing to help ensure permanence, if you will, because, you know, I'm not going to give it up if it's better than my old system in terms of my livelihood. And that doesn't necessarily, you know, maybe that means a constant ecosystem service payment or maybe it doesn't, I don't know. But, and obviously the more profitable without those, you know, direct payments, probably the better. Okay, good. interesting and good point. Um, any other, I'm gonna take it as sort of um, food for thought in going into the breakouts as opposed for a point of discussion right now. So um, any other comments or questions before we yes. kind of, yes, Ronald, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it was a very good summary and very good points. Uh, well, I understand that we put a lot of effort in measuring carbon and the additionality and the permanence, etc. But I think it's important to consider also two two factors. One is the I mean there is there should be a change in order to measure something, and for having the change, we need those actors who will adopt the practices. And sometimes we ignore, and those are the farmers. And sometimes it's not easy because although you can be sure that you are providing them with another alternative, sometimes there are cultural barriers that will not allow them to take on board your recommendations and come into this. So I think we sometimes forget that and it's not easy to convince them and have a big change there. That's one and also, I think it's very important to see, we are looking at, okay, measuring is expensive, the cost, et cetera, but uh, we need to also have some indication about the general cost on this, uh, if, especially if we go to the carbon credit market or we go to the results based, uh, but particularly in the carbon credit market, because as there is no article six, et cetera, so the prices are ranging a lot. And currently there is a huge movement of many companies who want to offset their um, emissions at a very cheap price. So of course, are we forced to reduce the cost on trying to please those cheap carbon credits or are we going to really value what we are trying to do? Okay, thank you for that. Pete, I wonder, you made a comment in the chat, maybe just give voice to that quickly and then we're gonna deal with some logistics here unless there's any other further comments before we try to move you into these breakout groups. And we are gonna make a, a change here um, based on uh, what I'm seeing in chat, chat, private chats here. But Pete, go ahead, please. Sure, thanks, Tim. No, no, I think it was just a comment that I made or was made or was briefly discussed or touched upon, you know, just at the end, I think, of last session, you know, which was that a lot of 
systems that we work in, you know, the effort is really about reducing, you know, or maintaining uh, soil carbon or reducing the loss, right, rather than maybe having net gains. So, of course, I think, you know, um, for us, of course, it's quite important. How is the market looking at that? You know, who would be interested in that? And to what extent, you know, will that also be considered something that we can, you know, push out? Because it, it is a bit of a different narrative and it sounds less sexy, but it might be equally or more important. Okay. And so Thank it was the whole discussion around the baseline. What do you use as a baseline? Change in trend, uh, you know, uh, is it a fixed, et cetera? And I think, you know, it is somewhere important for the narrative and for what we measure. And how right. we sell yeah. I recall that coming up late in the session, session and it does seem very important. And with that, I'm going to, I don't see any virtual hands or any human hands waving. Um, okay, so the, there's three basic questions that your breakout group, and the first is, it's not directly related to Pete's point, but it's somewhat related, which is what is the current or planned approach for soil carbon accounting for this project? Maybe what you can do is also maybe inject in that some discussion about this point about the baseline. It's not necessarily the same as the planned approach for uh, soil carbon accounting, but um, it seems to me it's somewhat related. How, and the second, so that's first question. The second is how could soil organic carbon uh, monitoring, reporting, verification and accounting uh, be improved uh, to help meet the project finance goals and investor needs? So this is project specific about how could the current planned approach to soil carbon accounting be improved, particularly to meet whatever the finance needs, um, going back to those three different tiers of financing and rigor, uh, accounting rigor that uh, Scenario presented. Um, so, you know, make it be fit for purpose uh, for that project, but how can it be improved? And what are the uh, priority practical next steps for this project to move forward with soil cor organic carbon accounting? So it's three very basic questions. That's that'll be the focus, and I think if I'm not mistaken, we may be combining two of these groups. But Madeline, if you could go ahead and put put the slide that you've been frantically working on in the background up here, and uh, all of you who have been involved in the planning of this, um, uh, please uh, help me guide the discussion here. But based on who is here. And uh, we do have some folks who will be joining late, but um, this is the current uh, approach that we're suggesting is to combine the two World Bank groups into one breakout group. So you'll need to uh, quickly, uh, we talked about this with uh, the Glomo and, uh, and Lini and Mirko and, and the other presenters. Um, you'll need to figure out right away whether you're gonna do that sequentially uh, or, or somehow in, more, in a more integrated fashion. But, uh, Deborah, you, I'm hoping you're comfortable uh, looking at this list here. Give me a little signal that you're ready to go with this. Yeah, looks good. Great. And Glomo and Lenny, uh, you, you're okay with what we're doing here? Great. Glomo, great, great. Two thumbs up. I like that. Right. And Paul um, and Conrad, you're good to go as well, right? Perfect. So. Um, we're going to put you into breakout groups. So if there's any challenges that, you know, that I don't get there in time for something that you need to get some, you can send an emissary back to the main uh, uh, meeting room and we'll deal with whatever it is. And then you can go back into the breakout. Um, but Madeline is going to put you into breakouts right now. Focus on gathering the data sets, ensuring that those data sets will, are used for calibrating models, but then also that they're used to support development of other projects. So even if this project is going to be super expensive because we have to calibrate models and collect all this extra data, just ensure that that data and work is valuable for helping to lower the cost of MRV in subsequent projects and programs. So that's, that's an important thing. Um, really a lot of emphasis on, on developing better modeling capabilities is going to be a key way to in, reduce cost of MRV. Um, looking to simplify the project designer scope I mentioned. Um, and then there's also a feeling that there's a strong need for um, perhaps creating uh, or, or a potential for creating maybe technology 
partnerships with upfront funding that would help bring together um, sort of communities of practice in this space for these complex landscapes and work together to design uh, protocols that would work for more than just, so every project isn't trying to do it by themselves, one, one after the other after the other. And upfront kind of financing for that, as well as acknowledgement of the extra expense for early phase projects. Um, I think that's about uh, how I would summarize. It was super rich discussion. If anyone from the group wants to add in something I've completely missed out, please, please do. Anybody from the group want to do so? Any uh, virtual hands being raised? Let me just get my participant list up here. Anybody uh, from that from that group want to add? go ahead, Keith? Did you raise your hand? No, I, I wasn't in that group. I just had a question, but I can take that in a minute. Okay, let me just see if there's anything else that anybody from the group wants to add before we go to question. All right, hearing none, seeing none. Go ahead, Keith. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, Be Beata wanted to say yeah. something. Go ahead. No, it's just uh, about the, the remark. I, I think I was one of those who mentioned that maybe carbon, so carbon is not, uh, would not be accumulated to be sold in a market. But uh, even if it's not uh, sold in a carbon market, it's still MRV for it is still very important because uh, so carbon sequestration in an agricultural system can qualify the, the product produced and it, it can aggregate a lot uh, to, the, um, uh, to the product of, of the farmer and, and it is still very important. So even if it doesn't enter in a carbon market, MRV for soil carbon is still very, uh, very valid. Great, thank you for that clarification. Anybody else from the group? Okay, go ahead, Keith. No, I was just, and yeah, Deb and the rest on the, it, it looks like a really interesting project. I was curious, how did you, how did you estimate your, both your carbon, you've got estimated carbon, soil carbon measurements, cumulative, uh, or what, what you think will be achieved? Was that, or is that kind of, that's an ex ante uh, estimate based on a particular model or a... I think Diego should respond to that if he can respond pretty yeah. quickly because we could also offline get into a good discussion on this but go ahead Diego I think. Yes um, thanks for the question Kit. we for this project we developed uh, our own models well the, the models for for the project so we conducted a field work we collected some um, soil samples, mm -hmm. some data from 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 the from the field, and then we analyzed those samples and we we produced the information, and then we okay. we constructed the the models All right. for yeah. yeah to know the the carbon trajectory. Yeah. No, I was just curious because I look you know partly looking at the pictures, but also what's being done, and then I I kind of noted it looks like the the, the rates of carbon increase that you're projecting are like less than a tenth of a ton per hectare per year, which is that that could well be, you know, that's that's a pretty low rate of accumulation and that's gonna be difficult to measure in a lot of places if there's even much background solar organic matter. So I was just kind of is wondering, is that, you think that is the, so they're going to be quite low rates of accumulation, less than a tenth of a ton per year of carbon, not of CO2 equivalent, but of carbon. And yeah. is that um, is, is that discounted in any way, or you think that's the actual biological average that you're going to see? Yeah, it is low. Um, but at least we found some differences uh, between these Silvopastoral systems compared to to the original um, conventional pastures, mm -hmm. and uh, these ecosystems or ecosystems where where uh, these these uh, where farms participating in in the project are located, mm -hmm. these ecosystems are not high in in soil carbon. Okay. There are other ecosystems here in Colombia where. Uh, soil carbon is is huge and accumulation is also huge, but these areas are not 
particular, mm -hmm. particularly high in current soil carbon. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me let me suggest we uh, let's just do clarifying questions about the project and the presentation of the results from the discussion. Are there any others before we move on to the other presentation? Because we really want to make sure we have a good group dialogue once we hear all of these presentations. Any others? I don't see any real or virtual hands, I think. Let me just check. Okay, who wants to go next? Thank you, Deborah and that group. Um, and um, Bailey Bill is ready to move to whatever the next project. Should we go to the World Bank projects? Yeah, we can do that. Okay, Bailey, go ahead. And uh, I think it's we, they just used one of them. I can't remember which one, but. Um, so I was gonna start, so on the World Bank project, we we were discussing two projects that are fairly different. Um, so I'll try to kind of uh, give a bit of a summary uh, for the two of them. Um, I was going to start with Niger, actually. What you see projected there is actually Kazakhstan. Um, but let me, so, so with Niger, um, if you allow me to kind of just uh, sort of rattle on about what was there. Unfortunately, you don't have that uh, projected for you. So this project was essentially one where, um, you know, the team is kind of trying to see if we can find some uh, result-based, result uh, you know, MRV system where, you know, would be sufficient enough, cost-effective cost uh, and low transaction uh, that could be attractive enough for, you know, the finance community here being particularly uh, donors. And in terms of what the current status of the project uh, or, you know, the planned approach is, is that um, the project itself didn't originally uh, sort of design the project with sort of carbon sequestration uh, in mind. So uh, what we ended up having there, though, is that you have a project that was really doing a lot of investment in uh, sustainable land and uh, water management uh, with some very good soil carbon benefits. And so the team wants to know whether there's an opportunity uh, that we could put something together in terms of an uh, uh, soil carbon accounting MRV approach, which could you know, ensure that the country is able to benefit from that. Um, and, and I suppose, so in this case, then the team was trying to see what could be done uh, with the situation that we have in the country, which is obviously a very difficult low data uh, situation. Um, and so there was sort of interest in knowing whether, you know, there was remote sensing and how remote sensing uh, could possibly be, be applied. Um, there was a point here around how activity data could really be important. And so as a next step uh, that would be needed in order to put something together, uh, you would really need to sort of improve on activity-based data. And here, it, there could be an opportunity to introduce uh, remote sensing, for instance. And I think one of the key issues that also came up was around uh, direct measurement and, you know, how much of it is needed or essentially how much of it the project could get away with, right? Um, uh, even though from the discussion, there was an indication that, you know, direct measurements may be necessary. I think this isn't a discussion that the team would also like to have going forward to say, um, do you really need direct, uh, you know, the measurements, how much of it uh, is, is needed and to what extent do we need and could we really find alternatives to that instead? Um, another key issue was on the baseline. So the project has been running for quite a few years, is towards its end, and we're thinking now about an MRV system towards the end of the project. So there was an issue around, uh, you know, ensuring that you have enough, enough baselines and sort of the approaches that could be used to try and, and, and have those. And here, there was a mention of, of proxies, um, but also the team was also mentioning that there were some sites that they're using for that. And also that's another discussion that uh, they would be interested in, uh, in, in talking about on the sort of uh, what next in terms of the priority. Um, so just to summarize in terms of priorities, really to try and get a sense of, um, you know, whether implementing soil, uh, direct soil carbon measurement is really necessary and we can't really do anything without that. Um, what can we get away with? What could be considered to be sufficient? Um, um, and, you know, to what extent, you know, farm level data could be replaced uh, with remote sensing data. I will give an opportunity to Omeko to add if I've uh, left anything in this regard. Um, and for, for Kazakhstan, um, I'm going to assume that's what you have projected or you're moving to it. Thank you. 
Um, so, so Kazakhstan was a little bit different. Um, so this is a, a project which is, you know, national, national scale. Uh, we're looking at uh, livestock improvement. And uh, so the team is kind of trying to see how, um, you know, two, two main goals primarily, you know, how the efforts of the investment that's going into that um, could really kind of inform uh, an MRV system that helps uh, the country to be able to demonstrate progress from these interventions and thinking in this case about sort of NDC uh, kind of uh, nationwide uh, tracking that would be done. And of course, sort of a second level goal, which would be, I mean, what could we also put in place if we really wanted to tap into a sort of a robust system for the ETS system uh, in the country. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, they're using a number of modeling options. They have the Rod C uh, model that they're using. Um, and, uh, you know, so teams did give a bit of a feedback about how in this case it's, you know, the calibration of these models going forward is important, but also the team, I suppose, is also uh, interested in knowing uh, about you know, I suppose the selection of the model itself uh, is, is still an issue and also the calibration and the validation of them going forward. Um, and here there was an issue uh, that, um, um, you know, direct measurements would be quite important in that as well. And also the project itself hasn't really been using much remote sensing. And so this is also a thing uh, that they would really like to think about to see how that could be introduced a little more uh, in the project. Now, uh, in terms of how to possibly improve, I think one of the key issues that came up there was that there would need to be some sort of demonstration, um, uh, you know, in some sites uh, that would, might need to be created, for an instance, you know, a few ranches here, say half a dozen, where uh, you could do some actual, you know, deep measurements that could really be used uh, by the team. Um, and in this case, also the issue of stratification did come up as something that would be important um, for, uh, for the team to also consider. Um, and I, I, I know uh, in terms of sort of the, the way forward, uh, things that we might be missing here uh, straight up that uh, I know the team might be interested in really kind of having a conversation is this VERA uh, a methodology uh, that is being used on sustainable grassland management. Um, and the specifications uh, that exist there, that's a conversation that they would be very much interested in having in terms of uh, priority next steps. But uh, immediately, you know, model sele uh, selection and also the identification of the remote sensing that could be used um, and sort of the plan on the validation uh, for the models. Um, and of course, uh, you know, data collection, particularly the direct measurement and how this could be linked uh, with sort of the extension work that they have going. Um, and, 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 you know, how that could possibly go to, uh, to reducing costs. And finally, also, you know, really thinking about uh, the institutionalization of this entire process since it's uh, thinking on this sort of national level and also thinking to tap into uh, the larger sort of uh, NDC, uh, MRV uh, in the country. Uh, to think about how to then institutionalize it. So um, in a nutshell, uh, that's uh, the discussions that we had between the two and uh, hopefully the team will have a chance to sort of discuss, as you can see, there's quite a number of things that are still very much uh, open-ended on their side. Uh, yeah, to get a chance thank to you. That. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just on the fly suggest a slight modification rather than if anybody has any additional comments to make from the group or questions, let's do that after we hear the third, the last presentation. Um, and thank you for, for that, Nicolomo. That was um, a good presentation of both of those. And in the chat box, I just want to bring attention to Pierre has uh, provided a link to the Vera uh, methodology for grassland management. Um, and, uh, and Ronald uh, Vargas has also uh, provided uh, a, a link as well uh, to an FAO uh, MRV um, document as well. So um, can I turn to the uh, the four per mill group, please. Who's the presenter? Hi, Tim. Yeah, it's uh, it was involuntarily. I've been appointed by Paul. So uh, any All mistake right. you, uh, are his his mistake. <laughs> All right. No, so uh, no, thanks. It was a very nice group. Very good discussion. And. Um, I think, yeah, let's just go through the, the questions then. What is the current and planned approach for soil accounting? Um, 
the project basically tries to, the philosophy is that of course you try to team up, you know, uh, communities or landscapes from industrialized communities with those with little uh, sequestration potential with, uh, with those in developing countries where there is more potential. <clears throat> uh, basically, it is activity based. Uh, projects uh, are currently, of course, trying to look for, for public funds and, and in that diagram, right, that triangle that was earlier shown, uh, it's really much more at the bottom, you know, with the green financing with very rather light MRV and a lot of focus on the co-benefits that are generated, particularly in terms of livelihoods and productivity, etc. cetera. Um, uh, when the activities were explained, of course, there was a comment within the group that, oh, if we do a little bit, we need, of course, a bit more biomass to get more biomass carbon in the soil. That requires a little bit of fertilizer, but that little bit of fertilizer, of course, might also create a bit more nitrous oxide emissions. So we, of course, have to pay attention to that. And of course, we then talked also about land use changes that uh, if farmers, of course, make more money, are they going to convert more land? We should actually, you know, make sure that we consider that and discourage that in the, in the approach. So very much, you know, um, activity-based with smallholders landscape type of approach. And we did discuss that, of course, a baseline would need to be defined. Coming back, of course, also on the earlier question around, you know, in these tropical systems, do we want to, is the ambition to maintain the soils and avoid reduction, you know, or actually do we really want to increase um, carbon content in the soil? Then the second question, how could uh, soil organic carbon uh, MRV accounting, you know, <clears throat> be improved to help meet the project's finance goals? Then of course, and the investor needs, that actually, you know, triggered a whole uh, series of questions around, well, who would be in the investors? And, the, and it was clear that in the beginning, of course, the way how the project was conceptualized and presented was really very much from a public uh, funding with very low um, MRV requirements then of course said well but even the private sector right they take commodities out of these landscapes you know they're actually quite interested to you know have uh, whatever coffee with lower carbon footprints or cocoa or whatever it is so there may, there may actually be quite an interest from the private sector you know to be engaged in this as well but that of course requires a bit more mrv particularly if private sector wants to claim that you know in terms of their carbon footprint um then actually that led even to a discussion whether you know anything that these projects do in the end um, at that landscape level, you know, are part of the NDCs. And then, of course, it was made clear very quickly that when you do the NDCs, you actually do need MRVs. So whereas we started, you know, very light public funds, green financing, it's all co-benefit and happy, happy, joy, joy. We have a bit of carbon as well. And then, of course, as everybody got, got, got more interested and we pulled in more potential investors, there was a sense that we needed a bit more um, accountability and a bit more MRV. One thing also that was discussed that, of course, when we have these co-benefits, we should actually really quantify them very well, uh, not losing, of course, the, the, the carbon story, but basically also showing that both in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, healthy soil management and focusing on soil carbon might actually much more even increase your nitrous oxide emissions. So that, that part may be bigger than actually the soil carbon part, as well, of course, as that what Debra already say, was saying, you know, that we have above ground biomass that is part of these uh, healthy soil management. So in the end, you know, both from a greenhouse gas emissions, we might actually create more of a carbon impact uh, outside the soil, you know, than, than inside the soil in terms of long-term carbon buildup. And then of course, besides that, you have all the livelihood, landscape, ecosystems benefit, you know, that come from these kind of projects. So I think, which actually brings us maybe already a bit to the last step, I know, that in the accounting, so again, you know, we did say that it had to be mostly activity-based, we can do multi scales because it's very difficult to do all the individual farmers, so it has to be more at the landscape scale. We can use some remote sensing, uh, we can do a bit of investment in the baseline, but um, yeah, I think that's it. I'm probably starting to lose now a bit of line of the story. So then maybe let's go to number three priority next steps. Um, the question was, of course, you know, should we start up then as well, you know, as this being a public fund thing, or should we also pull in? private funds, which probably do require a bit more MRV. How accurate, of course, that is something that you also have to learn. That depends on that private sector partner and what is their objective. As I say again, you know, being Olam, of course, working in tropical commodities, a lot of our clients would also be interested, you know, in the narrative of that product and not only purely, you know, on the carbon footprint of that product, but of course, both of them would be, would be nice, right? So 
I think the, the, the consensus was that we should start with public funds, but we could bring in private sector quite early on, or private funds, you know, to make sure that we don't miss any of the learnings or demands that might be required, that if we actually have a good model in the end, and we want to scale, then we certainly see that, oh, private sector is not interested because we forgot question number two that they had and we never addressed it, you know, in any of our efforts. Um, finance cap, yeah, there is, of course, there was also the sense that public funding is good, but there is maybe a finance gap, you know, uh, so we do need to pull in private sector. And then there was a good comment from Ronald earlier on, who was, of course, helping, you know, countries to try to identify landscapes and system with, with good sequestration potential. And that bringing that back to the public-private discussion, we also felt that, you know, that there are probably some landscape and some systems that might attract you know, less interest from the private sector because there is no product or narrative that they require from that area. So you know, we do see that there is a combination required of public and private, but that may be relating to areas in the landscape, potential kind of system and product that comes out of that. I think, I hope I touched most of it. I actually request Paul and my other friends from the group to chip in and correct. Okay, any, any major things missing? Okay, you did well, Pete. <laughs> Thank you, Pete, for uh, taking that assignment on. Um, all right, we have uh, about 20 minutes here because uh, Lenny's uh, closing remarks, uh, she's promised to keep them short and sweet. So we really don't want to maximize some discussion. I'm hoping that um, that this these presentations and the breakout groups that you're in have really generated some food for thought. And I'm just going to kind of open it up. I'm going to be tracking uh, the participant list and the virtual hand raising. Um, and then let me just make sure my view is properly set here so I can see. If you could come off video if you want to engage so I can see any hands that are waving that to get in the queue, but I'm going to open it up for discussion. Really, what are, what are your thoughts um, having lis listened to these presentations? What, you, you understand what our goals are here to sort of try to create some kind of breakthrough, some kind of understanding about how MRV can proceed on soil, organic carbon, using these as real live examples. So. What are the takeaways that you're you're uh, that are in your mind right now? Anybody, please. Let's start the discussion here. Uh, someone be brave and, and kick it off. Come on now. I know there's there, 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 there's definitely brains are churning away here. I, I'm sure of it. Just. Uh just so a kick it off, uh, Pierre here. Um, it's, and it's not com entirely on, on, <clears throat> on the MRV, but uh, just coming to my mind, it is certainly cheaper to keep carbon in soils than try to bring it back into the soil, augment uh, the, the soil. And uh, so this whole question about uh, keeping uh, the organic matter, keeping the soil organic carbon, uh, rather than seeing degradation progressing and then reverting, um, is, is I think very important, definitely important to the grassland question. And we haven't discussed that too much, but uh, how do we provide incentives for those practices that actually keep the, 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 the carbon, right? And uh, uh, of course there are issues of perverse uh, incentives or, or no, sorry, moral hazard there and so on. But uh, I think we, we should not completely leave that out of, that out of the question. It's, it's not only about increasing, it's really about also maintaining the soil climate. Yeah. A similar point that was made in the last week, but Deborah, go ahead. Looks like you're ready to jump in. Yeah, I was just going to respond to that and say that there's two ways of looking at it. One is the more like avoiding loss in, over the long term and everything, but the, the very popular and easy lift is avoided conversion projects, and they're actually pretty well established in the carbon markets. That's actually the easiest thing is if you can prove that you're not going to till it up and that it's under threat, and then you save what's there. That's the easiest. So there's there's two, two ways of looking at that, um, avoiding the loss. If you can, you know, get it, keep it away from conversion in the first place, that, that's the easiest lift. And that is so important. Super, super, super important. So we don't want to lose sight of that. Great. Thank you. Um, what, I, what really struck me with these presentations is that um, I was really interested. We were, it was amazing that we had, basically, we had three groups and each group was sort of focusing on a different part of the pyramid. Right. So that worked out really neat. I, I didn't know if that was really planned that way, but it worked out pretty cool. But what I noticed from that last presentation was that that, that bottom rung of the pyramid just did not seem to be 
it seemed like it was going to be so limiting in terms of financing that maybe it's just not it like right away you guys started talking about how can we move up a little bit so i thought i found that very interesting and insightful great but I, I do encourage the the project organizers the process organizers here to reflect on your own thoughts and prompt the group here with maybe there's some aspects of this you were hoping to get more out of the discussion than we than we did get so I don't know, Paul, any uh, scenario? Um, I don't see any other hands raised. So go ahead, Paul. Well, uh, it's true, but um, also at, as we are at the beginning of the project, um, that was very interesting to have the opinion of people that are in different places in different opinion. And uh, it, it opened our eyes on, on the, the difficulty we might have at the beginning and how, well, quite modest we may start with the public uh, public funding, and that would be easier for us to install that. And then after, I like the what Pete said about the, the narrative and the way we we can enlarge the public that can support the project by the narrative we can have behind the, the first results, and then go deeper in what could be a more strict MRV method. Uh, whatever we we'll start with private money if they want to join us. I think this is this is very um, very important for us to have those information and those uh, paths to to go to. Uh, I, I'm very glad that we had this discussion. Great, um, and I understand there's some kind of synthesis slide or some uh, something that could be shared here. But Sanira, I saw you raise your hand. Go ahead, see please. Yeah, it's only uh, a comment on this issue of uh, avoiding uh, carbon laws, right? And I think it should uh, make part of the project uh, design because. Uh, look, if it can uh, help us to deal with the, the issue of saturation, for example. So if we start increasing soil carbon, we know that if we increase, for example, one ton per year, we can assure that if we don't keep up with this practice, this ton will be lost, right? And then when you reach a kind of saturation, and then you should keep on this practice to not lose the carbon that had been uh, built over time. So in, in, in brief, what I mean, it's this issue of uh, uh, avoiding soil carbon loss should be embedded in the project design because for each carbon you will be built, for each carbon we have to keep to avoid it, its uh, uh, losses again, right? Great, thank you. Uh, other contributors, Dan, you just came off video. Did you wanna say something? No, not directly. Just uh, okay. yeah, this, it's been really insightful conversation for me to to sort of bring these different uh, opinions together uh, and, and look in a totally different context uh, than than what we've been considering in our U.S. project uh, here. So I, I I really appreciate the conversation and and thinking about kind of global scaling of these methods, particularly in places where you know model data set availability is is limited. Um, and that, for me, that was really one of the big takeaways from from our group. Um, you know about thinking about how all these projects can contribute to uh, to global globally available data sets that improve the calibration of of models. So, great. Glad glad that was the case. Um, go ahead, Lenny, and then uh, Conrad. Lenny and Conrad. Yeah, and on that note, one of my takeaways was that to the extent we can, for example, with these public World Bank projects, combine extension with MRV and collect data at the same time on you know the results of farmers practices as and have that be the activity data informing our our mrv you know that's a major win to the extent we can link national um you know mrv efforts with project le level so i feel like there's a and um debbie was getting at this a bit you know how do we bring together the communities of practice in a country and how do we bring it together the communities of practice working you know, in places where data might be analogous um, so that we can start to have some efficiencies uh, across these systems. We don't have to repeat everything everywhere. Great, thank you. Conrad, go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah, I felt um, now during the presentation, it was interesting that I had, I saw some similarities with the TNC project because in fact, you have the same problem as we, that you have um, maybe diverse, um, your land use practices and you have difficulties to really account for soil carbon and that's the same problem we face so we were principally saying okay there's no much not no much not much more to do than an activity-based protocol 
And the same thoughts, uh, should we rather focus on above ground biomass and then maybe just approximate below ground biomass uh, or below ground carbon? Um, we were also having this um, very shortly, but we also had this discussion. So maybe, especially when we come to the tropics and when we, when we look at this um, diverse um, land use systems, this could be something we, we should think of instead of really getting it more and more complicated to accurately quantify carbon, because we have the same notion that we want to have a, a better approximation than just um, activity-based payments. Great. Um, okay, Sadie, go ahead, please. So Sadie's been working on a sort of a, a, a an Uber summary, I guess, <laughs> um, a matrix that's gonna, uh, hopefully spur some further thoughts. We still have, you know, 10 minutes to go here. So um, if anybody else has any other reflections that you want to share with the group, please, please do so. Sadie, just go ahead and share your screen when you're ready. There we go. Um, okay. Sadie, anything you want to say uh, by virtue of just trying to get people's heads around what you just put on the screen? Um, so I sort of collected all of the highlights that everybody mentioned and I put them in here. Um, on the left here is the project, and then on the top is the current approach, what needs to change, and then next steps on the right. Great. So just trying to take all those notes and put it into one, one slide. So hopefully people can, can utilize that to uh, hone any thoughts that you want to share with the, with the group. And I'm just going to make sure my video. So Folks, yeah, this is a great opportunity here. I want to make sure you take full advantage of it. Pete, you've always had some th uh, thoughts. Any thoughts from you? Or uh, I don't know. I don't think Debbie's still on. If I don't think I see her. But what are people thinking here? What What are you taking away from this that you want to share with the group? No, I I do believe you know that uh, what Conrad was just saying, right? That with the TNC project, you know, the above below ground, the role of soil carbon compared, you know, to the rest of the system. I think you know that was definitely something you know that we recognized and was also important for us that's one and and then basically one question that i have right i mean you have if you have the pyramid for the i think from the private sector side where i'm coming from a lot of the clients right that we would be supplying the cocoa coffee edible nuts whatever we are selling to to them right they would be actually interested of course in the carbon footprint you know of that of that product which is still a bit different, you know, than, than selling, of course, you know, carbon credits at a landscape level, uh, which is maybe the pinnacle, you know, and you can actually sell those carbon credits. And I was just wondering, you know, to what extent uh, soil carbon and, uh, and carbon footprinting, right? Where are we sitting in that pyramid? What is actually required? For me, it's not too clear, you know, as I say earlier, right? We have a lot of private sectors that came out in the, over the last weeks, you know, at least for us, even, even in coffee that came out over the last week to all make these carbon neutral, you know, commitments. And we're just wondering like, how are they gonna implement that, you know? And so they will have to look at their carbon footprint of their produce. And so where would I be sitting in the pyramid and how does it fit to these projects? Because I have the feeling here that we are mostly trying to think, you know, at landscape level, carbon credits, you know, and, and it's, that's of course still a bit different, you know, from a carbon footprinting, which is much more a field level anyway. Um, Sorry, I'm just throwing it out because for me, of course, it's very, I haven't figured it out. And I'm not sure whether yeah. that's a question within the group. <clears throat> well, that's, that's a great thought though. And um, it's very relevant to that bottom of the pyramid to use that terminology from the, you know, the sort of MRV perspective. Um, Keith, I saw you came on video. Do you have a comment? And then I'm gonna ask the group in the last few minutes, what else should the project sponsors for this hackathon, what else do you want them to be doing? What do you think will advance the, the overarching cause here to improve MRV for soil organic carbon. So please come up with some thoughts as we try to close this out. Keith, did I, was I right? Did you? Yeah, no, I'll, uh, I guess I'll, I'll sort of continue to, to beat the dead horse in a way. And that, I, I really think that it's like the, the most important and in some ways, potentially the easiest lift part, it's not always easy, but it's really, again, it's activity data, activity data, activity data, because if you can, if you can know, if you can geolocate where your projects are, then you can use remote sensing and you can also, you know, I don't know, there's, there's certainly a lot of 
technologies for crowdsourcing information, you know, Jeff Herrick's land PKS and things like this, working on mobile phones, multi or, you know, non-lingual in a sense. I think that's, seems to me that's the place to start because that gives you an opportunity then to improve your monitoring, to, to actually collect data that can feed into models and stuff like this. And again, if you don't, if your activity data is not up to what, you know, not up to snuff, then you're, it's kind of like you're dead in the water. So I really think that that is the, you know, should always be the, the first thing to try to, you know, check all the boxes on. Yeah, thank you. Stefan, go ahead, please. Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, you know, I think one thing that, that jumps out at me and that we've heard is, is you know, models um, that are fed high quality activity data and, and you know, uh, reference data sets are, are critical kind of to scaling this up across the board. Um, and it could be, you know, there's, there's a variety of types of models from the, the more complex process-based biogeochemical to maybe simpler emission factor-based models. But, um, you know, the, the need to kind of standardize how models are used in, in uh, accounting of soil carbon and other ag greenhouse gases, I think um, we've in, in Vera recently come across, you know, the, the incredible amount of complexity when you're using these process-based models and sort of the, the technical capacity needed to use them and, and you know, setting some, some common guidance and standards around using them, um, also making them more accessible to a range of, of project developers. So it's not, you know, just a, a small handful of, of experts and, you know, the, the, a lot of costs associated with that. So that's certainly something we at, at Vera are looking at and we want to collaborate with other standards on this. And, and I would say, you know, if there's opportunities to support and underwrite these efforts um, uh, related to model usage, um, that would be a, a good next step that the, these folks um, we could think about. Excellent. Thank you, Stefan. Um, other thoughts on, on next steps to keep this effort going forward in a constructive way? Deborah, go ahead, please. I just wanted to throw out there because I know as soon as we dive into complexity and all the things that need to be done and have to be done, uh, I do want to put on the table that um, I think a lot of us agree that we can start doing these things and learning as we go and that that's really a, a really important uh, thing to be doing rather than saying we need another five years of, of science because actually we do have existing protocols through Vera and others. These things are functioning. We have MRV systems. So I, I wanted to put a, a positive spin after focusing on all the, the must-haves and the problems before we closed up the, the session. Okay, great. What are some other thoughts on, on, on some next steps to, to keep this effort, um, the momentum that we've gathered through the webinars and the hackathon? Anybody? Okay. Here, I just want to to thank the you know the organizer and the and the group here. Uh, the discussion was very useful to uh, to us, and uh, probably we'll get back to a few of you uh, with some questions. So thank you again. I mean, it was very helpful. Very good. Thank you, Pierre. Um, Linny, I'm thinking it's maybe over. To, oh, go ahead, Conrad. Yeah, maybe just one last remark from our side, from uh, four per mil. So um, as we already announced last time, we are uh, creating these task forces and we also have um, two or three task forces which are actually focusing on um, MRV and soil carbon accounting. So maybe this will be an option to keep the spirit alive and to keep on collaborating. So I sent out an email after the first um, webinar. So those who have not registered yet, you're very welcome. And we're, we would be very happy. Thank you. Thank you. Lenny, I'm going to I'm going to turn it to you here um, for some closing remarks in the last three minutes of the time that we have. Yeah, just want to say thank you to everyone for a marathon three weeks. Really great material, which we will post uh, and we have been posting on our different websites. There will be an event summary that you can access if you want to see slides and, and even recordings. Uh, we will also be thinking about some next steps. So please feel free to, to send those on to any of the organizers. And uh, we're, we hope that this has been useful for everybody. Thank you. And thanks Great. especially to Tim and Meridian and to our co-organizers and to all of our project presenters. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for everyone. And uh, thank you. so it's uh, very challenging to get through these, but thank you. Yes. And yeah, thanks. And to the note takers.
<laughs> yeah, and the note takers and everyone. It was a, a large team effort. So, um, okay, I'm, I'm really hoping you're going to all make really great progress on this very important issue. So I'll look forward to hearing more. So thank you, folks. Oh, all right. Thanks, Thank Dan. you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.